Naya Kawangi Yilian, Naya Kawaka, Nau Bila Dungacha, Nadang Bayita, Bayit Yama, Naya Kabaimi, Gadinwaka, Nayuba, Nabaya, Nagakarak, Nayika Putaka, Nami Mayani Bao, Nawarua, Naduma, Nadon Lunwala, Nade Gumana, Bao Rubu, Birumia, Manyanga, Gaima, Gaviota, Nga Gadinwaka, Gadinwakana, Nade Wungiwaka. I'm a child of the Dreamtime people, part of this land like the Nile gum tree. I am the river, softly singing, chanting our songs on the way to the sea. My spirit is the dust devils, mirages that dance on the plains. I am the snow, the wind, and the falling rain. I am part of the rocks and the red desert earth. Red is the blood that flows through my veins. I'm I am eagle, crow, and, and snake, snake that glides through the rainforest that cling to the mountainsides. I awaken here when the earth was new. There was emu, wombat, kangaroo. No other man of a different hue. I am this land, and this land is me. I am Australia. Everyone. My name is Lois Peeler and um, I'm your MC for this evening's event. Um, I'd like to um, acknowledge that this event is taking place on the land of the Woiwurrung and the Wurundjeri people are the traditional custodians of this area. I pay my respects to the elders past and present. If I could uh, ask Auntie Joy Murphy, Wurundjeri elder and the Trobe University elder, to give us a welcome to country. Thank you, Anna Joy. Thanks very much, Lois. Um, could I begin by saying that we are meeting on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people 
um, my father's country, and uh, there's not a moment, um, any, a moment any more prouder than to be here this evening um, with you all to see uh, the Warrawa girls dancing, to see the academic procession. And I do want to thank Nellie Green for a long time coming of bringing all the graduates together and uh, it's so great to see you from various institutions and your achievements. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to all of our ancestors, elders and communities across this great nation and indeed our neighbouring islands. Can I also acknowledge um, our incoming Chancellor, Richard Wilkins, um, our Vice-Chancellor, John Dewar, and our Adrian Clark is with us tonight, um, our outgoing, but I don't think she's outgoing. I think she's going to be there with us all the way. So just want to say a public thank you, Adrian, for uh, your commitment uh, to our community. To uh, all the distinguished guests that are here this evening, um, it is a great honour. I knew Hillis a long time ago and uh, particularly became more acquainted when Warrawa College was established in where I live at Hillsville and is still there today. And again, I just want to say that Lois, you've done, where are you? <laughs> Lois Peeler has done an amazing job um, keeping the college together and it has been a tiresome, um, a very brave and courageous thing to do. And, uh, but those girls um, and I, we actually met at the netball courts on Sunday, but you know, that's what it's all about, it's seeing those children being very happy, being feeling that they're comfortable and also participating in community and knowing that they're being loved. And uh, that's what they've been offered and I'm hoping that many more students will come to Warrawa College. Yay. <laughs> so in saying that I knew Hillis, I want to pay my respects to her for the wonderful achievement, for the vision that she had, her passion, her love uh, for a much more um, better education for our communities. And although it's not reached someone um, in particular, like anyone who may have lived in a community close by. And there are reasons for that, because it's sometimes difficult when you have different languages, different cultures. Let me say that just that connection, being on country, has impacted on a lot of people. And I can speak for that, um, living in the community. So I want to acknowledge her family um, and the contribution that they've made um, and you know when we have a, a visionary such as Hillis it's not about dreaming anymore it's about doing it and as I just said there are people like Lois and many others that are following that vision. As I said before we do meet on the land of the Wurundjeri people and uh, it's always a, a really pleasurable moment for me and such an honour. Um, to invite you to share with me from these branches. Uh, perhaps not tonight, uh, there's such a big crowd, so thank you everyone for coming, but it is about this gift and this symbolism, symbolism of this gift by just simply taking a leaf, and I hope that you accept it, because it means you join with us to pay your respects and honour the spirits of our ancestors who have walked this very land. Please enjoy tonight. Um, as the elder of the tribe, I'm, I'm feeling very emotional, very happy, and I'm sure it'll be a great night in memory of Hillis Maris. My language is the Woi Wurrung, Women Jakar, Wurundjeri Balak, Yemen, Kundi Bik. And you are most welcome to the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. Thank you. Thank you, Aunty Joy. Uh, before we go on, um, I would like to say how proud I am of my students, and I'd like to actually acknowledge them for being part of the um, ceremony this evening. And I just wanted to let you know a little bit about um, 
the girls and where they come from. And the fact that they have um, painted on their faces the uh, traditional designs of their particular clans. So we have about eight clans represented tonight uh, between the girls. And um, so we've got girls from uh, Tiwi, from Port Keats or Wadi, um, Alco Island, um, Victoria and Wamba Wamba, um, Pitted and Jara, Yanka and Jara, um, Lirija, and of course Yorta Yorta. So we have a diverse group of young women at Warrawa Aboriginal College, and I'm very, very proud of them. <clears throat> I'd like to also make mention of the designs around the room, which are actually Hillis's designs, uh, which represent the um, Doolan Yagan clan of the Yorta Yorta people, and Hillis uh, designed that herself. So we are surrounded with um, the traditional designs of uh, many, many clans tonight, and in particular, um, we're honouring my sister, Hillis Morris. Um, and um, uh, I'd like to, on a personal note, thank you all for, for coming. Um, I'd like to now introduce um, Lily Walker, who is going to perform a welcome for us. And I believe this is, uh, although Lily is Yorta Yorta, um, she has collaborated with Auntie Joy to sing a song in Wurundjeri language. So welcome, Lily. very beautiful and what a trooper she wasn't phased by that uh, little mess up thank you Lily that was very beautiful I'd now like to um, invite Dr Julie Andrews to the lectern Julie is uh, descended from the um, Wurundjeri people on our father's side and Yorta Yorta uh, on her mother's side near the borders of Victoria and New South Wales along the Murray. And she's a member of the Doolan Yagan family clan uh, of the Alapna people. 
Um, Julie has been uh, teaching Aboriginal studies um, for many, many years here at, uh, at La Trobe, and she is a convener of Aboriginal studies at La Trobe University. Um, Dr Andrews is my niece, by the way. Um, she's a fine educator. Uh, she's an anthropologist, and um, we're very proud to have uh, Julie, and we're looking forward to her sharing Hillis's journey. Julie. Once the Yarra was here, once Wonga was here, their protector, he came. Come and live with us, he said, as he promised them flour, sugar and tea, and red cloth. No more wearing those cloaks of skin. Be civilised. So they went, the old ones, with our great knowledge that was ours for countless thousands of years. And got us to school. And when I told my mother, she used to say, you've got to, you've got to be proud of being Aboriginal because we come from this type of background. We're not like these people. And she would explain to me and tell me the history of the tribe and who we were and our ancestors. And she takes so much uh, time to sit down and talk to me. You've got to stand up and fight, that's what she said. Let me take you on the journey of Hillis Maris. Hillis Maris, a Yorta Yorta Wurundjeri woman, was born in 1934 on the Cumra Aboriginal Reserve along the Murray River on the borders of New South Wales and Victoria. Cumbra in the Yorta Yorta language means my home. There are lots of happy times on the reservation as there are so many Aboriginal people living there and everyone helped each other and were related in some way. But there were also difficult times, as it was a place where government policies controlled the lives of everyone. When Hillis was 55 years old, her family were among 200 Aboriginal residents who walked off the reservation in protest over their treatment by the management. Hillis's family moved to a place the Aboriginal people called the Flats. It was situated between the Victorian townships of Shepparton and Maroopna. It is here that Hillis attended the local school for most of her school age. Living in a shanty town and attending school was not easy for many of the Aboriginal children as they were stigmatised as a group and in individually. There were many difficult situations in the classroom and playground for the Aboriginal students and in her later years, Hillis drew upon these experiences and observations to educate others on understanding the reasons why Aboriginal people felt unwelcome in Australian education. Hillis was a member of a large Aboriginal family and she had a wide network of cultural teachings and narrative stories passed on to her from her grandparents, parents and uncles and aunts. Hillis's strong narrative teaching played an immensely important role in her Aboriginal identity and influenced her work in her adult life. As a young woman growing up in Shepparton, Hillis was a member of a growing Aboriginal community that was active in sport and seasonal work, yet still facing barriers in obtaining ongoing employment and housing. Around the 1950s, Aboriginal migration was steady from regional Victoria to Melbourne, where people were finding better employment and housing. It was around this time that Hillis also moved to Melbourne. Aboriginal Melbourne was becoming a vibrant Aboriginal community in the suburbs of Fitzroy, Northcote and Thornbury. However, education was an area where Aboriginal people had been underrepresented. In the early 1960s, there was only about five Aboriginal students graduating with Year 12 in Victoria. After the 1967 referendum, education was clearly on the agenda for creating change and a better future for Aboriginal people. In the early 1970s, Aboriginal Melbourne continued to be a thriving Aboriginal community and many Aboriginal organisations were established and they still exist today. Along with other Aboriginal Melburnians, 
Hillis was instrumental in the establishment of the Victorian Aboriginal Health Service, the Aboriginal Legal Service, and an active member of the Aborigines Advancement League of Victoria. Hillis and other Aboriginal men and women formed a strong alliance to support each other in working towards a better future for the generations to come. Amongst all of this activity, Hillis also structured her own education pathway. In 1977, she was awarded an overseas scholarship to London and studied with sociologists Richard and Hepzibah Hauser on their research on the new society that defined stress and duress within a society. She then travelled to the United States of America where she stayed with the Hopi people of North America and critiqued histories of colonised peoples and explored Indigenous knowledge. This was the beginning of her work in applied social research and community development. Hillis applied social theory and Indigenous knowledge to address the damages caused by colonialism to Aboriginal people. Her research focus was aimed at creating a strong Aboriginal self and finding one's place in Australia. Hillis's philosophy was that the Aboriginal self was based upon culture, language, family and community and that our Aboriginal people need at least one or all of these elements in their life. Hillis believed that education was what Aboriginal people required to survive. Yet education that provided our own Aboriginal culture that would empower the soul and create pride in our people. In 1980, she established Kurrarook, a pilot project based at Yarrambat, designed to research Aboriginal teaching methods and curriculum development. She believed that the key to inspiring Aboriginal children to learn was to merge mainstream curriculum with Aboriginal cultural teachings in an Aboriginal setting. By using her own nieces and nephews, Hillis researched this method for approximately seven years. The Kurrarook project then relocated to Frankston and was registered as Warrawa Aboriginal College, the first independent Aboriginal secondary school in Victoria. The college is now situated at Hillsville and has attracted students from across Australia. You have seen some of the remarkable students here tonight. But I want to close with a final comment on how Hillis Morris has contributed to Aboriginal studies at La Trobe University. La Trobe University takes pride in its history of being a progressive university and quickly supported the Hillis Morris Memorial Lecture because it was unique. It was celebrating a woman's contribution to education. This fitted nicely with the Aboriginal education strategy of this university. Hillis Morris and Sonia Borg, shown here, co-wrote the award television um, series titled Women of the Sun, which won national and international awards. The, the series is still used in Aboriginal studies because it creates awareness of Australian history to students who would not otherwise have the opportunity to observe Aboriginal culture, language, the arts, humour, kinship, community, oppression and resilience all in one place. Although her brilliant short metaphor titled The Concrete Box was written over 30 years ago, each year it resonates with students when critiquing government policies over Aboriginal lives. It is the easiest piece of reading I've given my students to read and they always read it and it is the most powerful. Hillis Morris is very much a part of Aboriginal studies at La Trobe University and will continue to be. We honour her contribution to education and the arts. In recognition of International Women's Day, we also acknowledge the work that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women have made to education. Thank you. Thank you, Dr Andrews. And yes, I'd like to also um, comment and say happy International Women's Day to all of the, the women here. It is uh, significant that we're able to celebrate um, 
the achievements of uh, an Aboriginal woman, um, some amazing uh, achievements, if I do say so. Hillis, uh, as you've heard from, um, from Dr Andrews, was um, foremost in not only in education but also in the arts, in uh, the political advancement of Aboriginal people, not only in Victoria but in fact across the nation. And uh, so we have much to celebrate. So it's now uh, my privilege to introduce um, Professor John Dewar, the Vice-Chancellor and President of La Trobe University. Professor Dewar is an internationally known family law specialist and researcher. He is a graduate of the University of Oxford, where he was also a fellow of um, Hertford College. Uh, Professor Dewar was named by the, uh, the Australian as one of the most influential people in higher education in 2014 and 2015. And he's um, made an incredible difference at La Trobe University and within the academic community internationally. It is an honour to have him take part tonight in this important occasion. Would you please join with me in welcoming Professor John Dewar to the podium. Thank you, Lois. That was overly generous, but um, thank you nevertheless. Um, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Welcome everyone to La Trobe University, to our Bandura campus. Today, as you might have heard, is our 50th birthday. It's the very day on which the first students enrolled at the university and our first chancellor was installed. And when we were <clears throat> in the early stages of planning our celebrations and the events that we would accompany that, uh, we made the decision very early on that it, this lecture was to form the absolute centerpiece of our birthday. Um, <clears throat> the lecture had been initiated in 1999. Um, for some reason, I don't fully understand, fell into abeyance in around 2007. Um, but we were absolutely delighted to be able to resurrect it um, in, in our anniversary year. It's also a nice coincidence that this is also um, International Women's Day and we thought honouring a great Australian woman and a great Aboriginal woman was an appropriate, excuse me, appropriate thing to do. Um, we have uh, an amazing history at La Trobe of supporting Indigenous students. Um, and I just want to share with you two pieces of data that um, just prove how well this university is doing. Um, the first is that this year, for this semester that's just started, we have for the first time ever exceeded 100 Aboriginal enrolments in our first year class. We've never achieved that before. Um, yeah. <laughs> And I just, I just wanted to pay tribute to Professor Mark Rose and to Nellie Green, who between them do a fantastic job of firstly attracting students to the university and then keeping them here and helping them through to graduation once they've arrived. The other statistic is that this year for the first time, we have achieved the target we set ourselves back in 2012, which was that we would enrol enough students of Aboriginal heritage to uh, bring the, the Aboriginal population uh, of our students into parity with the population of Aboriginal people in the Victorian community at large. Population parity was our goal, and this year we've achieved it a year early. So, <laughs> now, there's always more that we can do, of course, and we will. Last week, it was my great privilege to be in Canberra uh, for the launch by Professor Peter Bucks Buckskin from the University of South Australia of the University's Australia Indigenous Strategy, which commits all 39 of Australia's universities to increasing their Aboriginal enrolments by 50%. And we will uh, put ourselves wholeheartedly to that task. But this is not just about numbers, because recently Malcolm Turnbull acknowledged that the only area in which in this country we have actually closed the gap 
is in the area of achievement of Aboriginal higher education graduates. Aboriginal students who come to university, who complete a higher education degree and then go out into the workforce, achieve exactly the same life chances, have exactly the same life chances as their non-Aboriginal counterparts. I wish we could say the same of other parts of uh, the, the indicators in, of closing the gap, but I'm delighted that in this particular area, the gap has been closed. So it remains as important as ever that we continue to work to increase the number of students coming to the university and the number who graduate. In that context, I have just a couple of announcements to make tonight to that, that will support us in that objective. The first is that we have received funding from the Felton Bequest to establish an indigenous stream of our very successful Aspire program. This will be called I Aspire, and it will support up to 50 indigenous students to study across our, our campuses in regional Victoria, as well as here in Bandura, and will be designed to encourage and support them to come into university. Um, and I believe that members of the Felton Bequest Committee are here tonight, and we are extremely grateful to them for their support. It will make a huge difference. We've introduced a new Vice-Chancellor's Excellence Scholarship to support a high-achieving Indigenous student with, in their studies with us, um, with the scholarship going to an Indigenous student with an ATAR of above 85. And last Saturday, the La Trobe University Footy Club held its 50th anniversary reunion, and they have committed themselves to raising yet more money uh, to fund a new Indigenous scholarship scheme. Their aim was to raise $50,000 for our 50th anniversary, but before the fund has even been announced, they've already raised $80,000. <laughs> so who knows what, what the potential is, but there will be more resources there to support young Aboriginal students coming to the university. So we are enormously proud to be able to host tonight's event. It was just simply wonderful to see the academic pr pr procession um, led in tonight by the girls from Warrawa Aboriginal College. What a positive and powerful image that was. Once again, welcome to La Trobe. We're all looking forward to hearing our speaker tonight, Dr. Anita Heiss, deliver, I'm very proud to say, the 2017 Hillis Maris Memorial Lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Dua. Um, I'd just like to say a couple of words um, about the lecture because um, I had the privilege of being involved in the very first um, days of it um, being introduced. And I was very proud and, uh, of what um, La Trobe University has done to support Indigenous education. So that was going back um, many years. And um, I think that even before the lecture was introduced, La Trobe was um, conducting um, professional development programs for our Aboriginal community leaders. And um, so there's been a lot of work done through this university, apart from what the, the wonderful um, procession that we saw tonight. And I'm so, so choked up, really, to see all of our people um, who have you know, made this wonderful journey and that we're, we're so proud and it's something for our young people to really look up to. You're indeed role models and I salute you all. Thank you. And now, I think if I could ask the um, Aquinas College Soul Sisters, we had to put a little soul in the evening, ladies and gentlemen, so here they are, and they're going to sing a song that many of you will have heard, uh, particularly through the movie The Sapphires, and so they're going to do us the honour of uh, singing that song for us tonight. Thank you. Pura 
fera yumna, pura fera yumna, pura fera yumna ya la ya la. Yenuk be ku Jesu, brada bukana yumna, mara pura fera yumna ya la. Nara pura fera yumna ya la ya. Thank you, girls. Made me want to get up there and join you all. <laughs> um, friends, uh, it's now my pleasure to ask Do Dr. Anita Heiss uh, to the podium. Dr. Heiss is uh, a, an ambassador of our college, and uh, she's also a member of the Wiradjuri Nation, and is one of Australia's most prolific and well-known authors of Aboriginal literature. Beyond that, Anita has many other titles and occupations. Internationally published author of poetry, prose and fiction, historian, a speaker who is in demand around the globe. Dr. Heiss is also the ambassador for the Indigenous Literacy Foundation and an advocate for the National Centre for Indigenous Excellence. She currently manages the Epic Good Foundation. To all this, Anita brings humour, honesty and accessibility that makes all Australians, in fact, all audiences, free to sit up and take notice. Thank you, Anita. Thank you, Annie Lois, for that wonderful introduction. I was really hoping you would keep the bar much lower <laughs> than that. I need to find a clicker. It's so wonderful. I'm honoured to be here in the land of the Wurundjeri peoples. I'm a Wiradjuri woman from central New South Wales. I'm a Williams from Cowra, Brungle Mission, Griffith and Tumut. I was born on the land of the Gadigal, raised on Darawal land. I currently live on the land of the Yuggera, and I feel like I'm constantly in someone else's place but I always feel welcome, and I do tonight, and thank you, Annie Joy, for that beautiful, warm welcome to country, and to the beautiful Lily for her song. I feel like I have no talent whatsoever. The Soul Sisters for their singing, to the Warrior Girls for dancing us in with Brother on the Didge as well. I, um, I want to acknowledge, obviously, as a writer, the first storytellers of this place, the Wurundjeri people. And to the elders past and present, thank you for paving the way. I want to acknowledge all the VIPs in the room, and by that I mean all the very Indigenous peoples, <laughs> because I think we're all important. <laughs> we're all here to pay tribute to Hillis Maris and her contribution to Aboriginal education. La Trobe University chooses to acknowledge her through this memorial lecture and I'm, that was initiated in 1999 and as I got off the plane today, I got a text message from Dr. Sandra Phillips with some background to it. She said, you probably know this already, but you know, Jackie Katona gave the inaugural lecture and she got a standing ovation. <laughs> and I texted back, said, thanks for the pressure. So no pressure on any of us here this evening for that and hello to everybody who's watching this via live stream. I, I only need these to see you, I don't need them to read, so it's a bit weird, I might take them off. Um, sorry. Um, what, what I'm, ha I'm glad it was revived, and I think um, the professor, can I call you John? 
I think John said uh, 2007 it, it fell away. We're bringing it back this year, which is fantastic, because what it does is, by reminding ourselves and acknowledging Hillis Maris, is that we are reminding ourselves that we, when we teach Aboriginal children to be strong in identity, to know their history, and when we give them ed an education, we are giving them what Hillis had said is the tools that they need, not just to survive, but to thrive in mainstream society. I need to also say that the, 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 the title of my paper that was in the um, program at the 11th hour, because I'm an artist, I assumed artistic licence and I changed the whole thing. So I'm doing something else. <laughs> so if you came for the original, I'm sorry. Um, before I go on, I need, to, I want to make mention of the academic procession. Because I thought if, we were, if all we did tonight was talk about you, we would have had a celebration of Indigenous education right here. And so I wanted to just flag the skill set and the, the diversity of talent and the areas that we're working in, just in the group of people that walked up the aisle with all the pomp and pageantry that academia dictates we have. So in our group tonight, we have uh, professors, directors, research fellows, managers, deputy secretaries, CEOs, academics, and so forth. The areas of expertise Cover and disciplines covered by this group alone is extensive. And the list, I, I, I asked for a list to see who was going to be here, included, and I'm sure I may have left something out, health, media and communications, social ecology, law, sport, hospitality and tourism, international relations, international community development, arts law, social work, accounting, human services, indigenous studies, mental health, creative arts, history and philosophy. That's quite an extensive list. Um, apologies if I've left somebody else off. So I'm wondering, when I looked at this list, and we're in this space with, which is overflowing with talent and intellect, how is it that a girl like me, who was born and raised between Long Bay Jail, Malabar Sewerage Works, and Orica Industrial Estate, <laughs> perfect setting for creative inspiration. People laugh, <laughs> but it, was, it is. Um, how is it that someone like me got a gig to stand here when there's all this talent. Now, some of the things that Annie Lois mentioned might, you know, might give you uh, some, give some reason for me to do this, and I, it's okay if you ask the question because I ask myself the question. I'm standing here tonight wearing a range of hats and with a few achievements simply because my parents placed a very high value in education. They believed, as Hillis Maris did, that education is the key. They wanted their daughter, for all their children, to have the education that they hadn't been afforded as children. My mother was born on a Rambi mission in Cowra. My father was born in a little Austrian village called St. Michael in Salzburg. Neither of them had adequate schooling in their youth, but they shared a work ethic and a dream that their children would not go without the best education they could. And we didn't. I went to St Andrews Catholic School at Malabar, then I went to St Clare's College at Waverley before doing my undergraduate degree, a BA in History at the University of New South Wales. Photo op. One chin, please. <laughs> Thanks. I don't think I've signed anything that said you can print any of these, so I've photoshopped them. It was in my honours year that I decided to become, um, sorry, it was. Well, I didn't decide to become an author, I decided to write one book. Um, I didn't realise that um, 20 years later or 21 years later that I would be 16 books in with two on the way. In fact, when I was a child, I wanted to be a nun. I could be a nun now. Um, then I want, don't tweet that. Then I, wanted to be, <laughs> then I wanted to be Ginger from Gilligan's Island at one point, because she's very glamorous, but I was more like Mary Ann. I had plats and played cricket in the street. And then I wanted to be an air hostess. But going to university not opened up not only my mind, but the possibilities of what I could do, what I could be, and the difference I could make as a young Aboriginal woman with a support network that guaranteed that I could be and do anything that I wanted, except perhaps be Ginger from Gilligan's Island. It was in my honours year that I decided to write a book called Sacred Cows, or because of my honours year. So I did my honours degree on the 1967 referendum, and every single book I got off the shelf that year about anything to do with Aboriginal Australia, now I can put this on to see you, but anything to do about Aboriginal Australia was written by 
a non-Aboriginal person. And some of those books were written by people who'd never been to Australia. And one of the books that I got off the shelf was uniquely titled Australian Aborigines. And I had to give a seminar paper on this book. And it was written by somebody in the UK. And it was based on letters written to this fella by someone in the new colony in New South Wales who would write letters saying, today we did this with the natives, and today we did that with the natives, and he'd send it off. And one day, five men took this fella hunting, five Aboriginal men took this fella hunting, and they left him for a short period of time, and only four came back. So he assumed they ate the fifth one. <laughs> now, we laugh, but it's insane. You go out for refreshments, you're all supposed to come back. Some of you don't come back. I'm not going to assume you ate the people who didn't come back. <laughs> and we laugh because it's so ridiculous. It's insane. But what's not ridiculous is that moment in time, his perception of what happened is written down, becomes published. People, I get it off a university library shelf 100 years later. People are reading this as fact and history about who we are. And I never heard about cannibalism in any of my education out of school, I never heard about cannibalism in Aboriginal communities until Pauline Hanson came into power. That's another lecture. <laughs> he writes this letter back to Britain, the natives are cannibals, and he says, you know, they took me hunting, they so they must have eaten the fifth one. How many people read that book not knowing? So I had two epiphanies then at that moment, and I realised one was that history is completely Subje the recording of history is completely subjective. And I know there's historians in the room, but I have the mic. <laughs> if we, and the way in which the colonisers and co remember and record history is going to be significantly different to the way in which the colonised remember and record history, as we know. If we all came back here tomorrow and I asked you to record the history of this evening, I guarantee you every single one of you would record it differently. There are facts you can't change. That we're at La Trobe, it's International Women's Day, the program and so forth. I'm fabulous. Facts you can't change. <laughs> Even I, but I would record it differently because, because I'm up here with the different perception of the evening. It's all good, huh? Great evening. Well done. Now I need to do this. So, I realise in recording of history, I'm studying history, I need to use my skills to record something. I decided to write this book, Sacred Cows, and it came out in 1996. It's no great piece of literature, I can say that. I hope it's my, my books are better now. But um, when I was repaired, so I wrote this book based on my observations of being a black fellow, growing up in white society and so forth, and it's a social commentary, Skippy, Vegemite, the Backyard Barbecue and so forth. And just looking at, looking at white society through a different lens, doing, doing the things that they were doing to us all the time in books that I then had to read at university. Now, when I was preparing for this event, it actually made me think back to my undergraduate days oh, and my postgraduate days. Um, and in the 1990s, when I was doing my PhD, it was the height of political correctness. And black fellas were being invited to be on every panel and committee that was going. It was, uh, at that time, I penned a radio piece called Token Corey's Blackfellas for Hire. And it's a one-sided phone conversation where someone rings up and they say, Token Corey's Blackfellas for Hire. We provide Aborigines for weddings, barbecues, bar mitzvahs, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's, and, and all the ridiculous questions people were asking for, the one Aborigine who would sing and dance and play the ditch and have arms like AFL players and everything else. So, when, but it was no different being a PhD student because I would get calls all the time. When I was studying, I was told there were about 20 Indigenous people who had graduated with PhDs at that time. And I was doing guest lectures by invitation, but also I had to do it as part of my degree. And I figured it was pretty easy to find who the black fellas were doing their studies at that time, because there were so few of us. And I got a phone call one day from the University of New South Wales saying, will you come and do a lecture on Aboriginal women and feminism? And I said, that's not my area of expertise. My area of expertise is Aboriginal literature. And they said, yeah, but you know, you're an Aborigine and you're a woman, so you can do it. You know where I'm going with this. So I reluctantly did it because 
I don't know why I did it, to be honest with you, because I was no good at saying no at that point. I'm much better at it now, except to you, aunt. I can never say no to you, which is why I'm here. So I did it, and I talked about the differences in realities for life as Aboriginal women and white women using work by Romaine Morton and this fantastic poem called Ode to Barbie. I'm not sure if Romaine's here this evening, but I did see, I think she's a former graduate. Of course, today we have postgrads across faculties and disciplines as seen in our academic procession, so we can and should present on a range of topics. If only the inappropriate request to me would stop. So, someone told me blondes have more fun. Lee bleached the hair out of my head. <laughs> not even a date, but there you go. In 2001, that's my dad. In 2001, I became the first Aboriginal person to graduate from the University of Western Sydney, which is now Western Sydney University. It was a big deal at the time, but given that Western Sydney is the home of the largest concentrated Indigenous population in the country, people should have been asking, why did it take so long? And don't get me wrong, my experience at UWS was fantastic. The faculty bent over backwards, um, knowing that I would be their first enrolment as a doctoral student, and they accommodated me as best they could. And I'm proud to maintain a relationship with the university today. Now, once I completed my PhD, my, the Bound thesis, later published by Aboriginal Studies Press, um, Thula Yella, uh, I gift wrapped it as a present for my parents, as a gift in return for their emotional, mental, and financial investment in my education. A solid education was the best gift that they could have given me. Now, while my parents were incredibly proud of me, I was aware that the bound work that I gave them represented far more than an academic achievement. For me, it represented the mammoth differences in education between three generations of Aboriginal women in my family. I've had a secure and stable private school and university education, spending five years of my life researching and writing about Aboriginal literature and publishing, something I was interested and passionate about. But that's a privilege, well, it was a privilege. However, only two generations ago, my grandmother Amy's education consisted of learning how to scrub, sew, cook and pander to the needs of the white family she would go into service to. At the age of 11, she had already been institutionalised in the Kudamundru Aboriginal Girls Home for six years, whereas I, at the same age, was in Sydney playing netball, cricket in the street, having tennis lessons, going to Luna Park and having family picnics and so forth. For her part, my mum was educated in country schools, Brungle Mission, Arambi Public School, Hanwood Primary in the summer, Darlington Point in winter, and Rockdale Primary. She attended Griffith High School until she left at 15 years of age. In 1989, Mum went back to study at Randwick TAFE two days a week for two years when my younger siblings, Gazella, Joseph and Mark, were in school full time and I was at university. At the end of her study, she received the college medal and a certificate that enabled her to be employed as a health worker in the Aboriginal community. She worked in the field for 14 years, many of them spent running a diabetes program at La Perouse before helping to set up the Aboriginal Catholic Ministry in 1993. In 2010, my mum was awarded an honorary doctorate from the University of Notre Dame for her decades of work and commitment to the community and the church, particularly the Aboriginal Catholic Ministry. Now, when I consider the forms of education my grandmother and mother had, my years of tertiary study seem almost meaningless in terms of the struggle of Aboriginal women in the, fam in the Williams family. And as proud as I am of my PhD, uh, the academic challenge that it entailed in my ensuing successful career, I feel it often pales into comparison to the fact that at the same time, my grandmother's and my mother's lives were very, very different. But their past is always with me as a reminder of who I am, where I have come from, why I am here, and why I do what I do in my career. Their lack of opportunities and their struggles remind me that I must always seize every opportunity to learn but also participate and give back, which leads me back to Hillis Maris. Um, from her birthplace in Kamaragunja Aboriginal Reserve and later, uh, later life on the river flats of Marupna, Hillis first knew firsthand the struggle Aboriginal people had if they wanted an education that would enable them to do and be what they wanted, while at the same time being able to remain immersed in all aspects of their own culture. Her dedication, 
Her dedication to the cause and sheer determination saw the establishment, as we know, of Warrawa Aboriginal College in 1983. Hillis is often referred to as a visionary. Her vision of a school that catered for the academic, the social, the emotional and cultural needs of children is central to current thinking in Indigenous education to support our young people to stay in school, to achieve ed educational attainment critical to the building of our communities and our nations. I'm fortunate enough to have spoken at one of Warrawa's uh, graduation ceremonies. Last year, I had the extreme pleasure of emceeing the debutante ball, and most recently in my role as manager of Epic Good Foundation, supported the establishment of a partnership between the college and Ringwood Cricket Club, who are delivering a program to students who have expressed an interest in learning more about the great game of cricket. There's a point why I'm raising this. Now, in December of last year, participating students finished the first six-week block of the cricketing program with Ringwood, and the coach, Ian Holland, uh, said to me, the girls showed talent and developed across all the skills of cricket and I'm very sure they had a lot of fun doing it. The program is developing and evolving as we go but we have a vision that is that this connection will create a pathway for the girls to play competitive cricket in the future if that's what they desire. And I thought, why shouldn't they? A life's education is, simply, is not simply just academic. Now, from Warrawa to La Trobe, I thought to myself when I was writing this paper, what would Hillis be proud of as we gather in this space tonight? For starters, I'm sure she'd want to applaud the fact, as mentioned by uh, the, um, Professor Dewar, that for the first time in 50 years, La Trobe has over 100 commencing students. I'd say she'd also be happy that there are currently 300 Indigenous students enrolled at La Trobe. I'm told that enrolments are still happening, so that number could increase. But as it stands, um, as the VC mentioned, this number represents that La Trobe are on target for doubling their enrolments over the last three years, as set in the university strategy, Future Ready. It's comforting to know also that support and retention here is led by Nellie Green, uh, who's a Yamachi woman from Western Australia. And when you think about that, what it tells us is that places like La Trobe are attracting people, a diverse group of people from around the nation to come and work here. So that's fantastic as well. It's a pro there's a program that operates out of the Office of Indigenous Strategy and Education. It's called Turong Manong. I hope I've pronounced that right which has all nine Victorian universities collaborating to lift the quality of service to Indigenous families and communities. This includes a 24-hour 1-800 number when ATAR schools are announced. The program is an accord between the Victorian Vice-Chancellor's Committee and the Victorian Aboriginal Education Association. To go further, and I love this, the number of uh, completions by Indigenous students at La Trobe in the last three years is also on the rise. And what is also a feature here at La Trobe is that from 2015, every commencing student is required to complete a one-hour online subject on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives. Thus far, over 20,000 students have completed the module, contributing to their understanding of Indigenous issues and their role as global citizens. Uh, I think this is something that all Australians should, should, should do, and I'm wondering if La Trobe can maybe roll it out with the NBN. <laughs> <laughs> or faster than the NBN. <laughs> Take that back. <laughs> Tweet that one. Uh, from my perspective, this is a very exciting... I, I, I didn't know all this about La Trobe until I started doing some research, and I'm going, this is amazing. This is a really exciting place to be, a really exciting place to work and study, and I don't know why I haven't been offered a visiting author's position here. <laughs> so, John, <laughs> my people will be talking to your... You don't look away. My people, <laughs> my people, and most of them are in the audience, will be talking to your people. No, all jokes aside. Um, no, what I love about this, so, and things do change over time, and I don't know where Macquarie is at right now, but when I taught at Macquarie University in 2005, 2006, there was not one course at that university that had Indigenous studies as a compulsory unit. And I've been saying that, I've been saying since 2005 that no student should graduate from any tertiary institution having not done something on Indigenous studies. And the reason at the time when I was at Macquarie that all my students were nearly, my 200 plus students, most of them were internationals because the Australian students didn't see the relevance 
to the, to the course, to their lives, to their work. And that's because the university proper did not see or accept or appreciate the relevance of Indigenous studies for their students. Now, the professor, I think, I don't know whether you read my paper, but you stole half my stats. So as mentioned by the professor, Professor Dewar, there's a new commitment by Universities Australia to increase Indigenous enrolments nationally by setting new targets in a bid to attract thousands more Indigenous students to campuses across the country. The University's Australia strategy aims to boost student and staff numbers over the next decade, trying to increase Indigenous student enrolments by at least 50%, as mentioned, above the growth rate of non-Indigenous enrolments, and ideally by 100%. According to media reports, if enrolments are met, an estimated 6,500 extra Indigenous students could be studying for degrees in 2020, and that's only three years away, so that's fantastic. Um, Professor John Dewar was quoted, actually, as saying, La Trobe is committed to increasing Indigenous student enrolments, which will only help to grow the already strong Indigenous culture and research we have across all our campuses. Together with our Indigenous strategy and education department, we are continually looking at ways to close the gap for Indigenous people. I was pleased to learn that Professor Mark Rose, who is here this evening, is also, exec who is also Executive Director of Indigenous Strategy and Education here, sits on the Deputy Vice-Chancellor Academic Committee for the University's Australia Strategy. It's great to see Latrobe uh, taking a seat at the big table on the future of Indigenous higher education. And on a final note, uh, Turong Manong, I mentioned, I mentioned earlier, has also been cited by Universities Australia as a strategy that uh, is an exemplar. Now, it's International Women's Day. Happy IWD, titters and sisters in the audience. Uh, as I'm an author, I wanted to mention some amazing women writers who have impacted on the education of not only our, our mob, but Australians at large. I do professional development with teachers, teach librarians and principals, and I kind of pride myself on the fact that I can find a, a, a novel, a play, a poem, um, an autobiography or a memoir on almost, that will touch on whatever topic they can throw at me. We currently have over 6,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander writers and storytellers indexed into Black Words, the Black Words data set of Auslit. Just on half of those are women writers and storytellers. 171 of those are authors who have penned over 200 works that touch on education. These aren't literary education pieces. These are literary novels, poems, and so forth. Um, and some of these are some of the covers of some of my favourite books that I have on my shelves. I just wanted to flag two women this evening who were part of my university journey as an undergrad and postgrad. They are Kath Walker, who later, later changed her name to Ujiru Nunakul as a protest against the bicentenary, and, and again, the late auntie uh, Ruby Langford Guineby. When people ask me what my most prized book is, I say my hardcover edition of Kath Walker's We Are Going, which was published by Jacaranda uh, Press in 1964. It was the first book published by an Aboriginal, first collection of poetry published by an Aboriginal person. It has the Charter for Aboriginal Rights in there, and that charter is as relevant today, unfortunately, as it was back in 1964. Now, 1964, we don't have, we haven't had the referendum, a lot of our mob living under the Act of Protection. We have a book of poetry published by an Aboriginal woman that sells 10,000 copies. Can I tell you, I don't know any Australian poets today that are selling that many books. But that's how, how much desire there was to read her words. But it was also at a time where reviewers didn't believe that the work had been written by a black fella because it was so good. And when she read the Charter of Aboriginal Rights out at the Fakatsi meeting in 1972 in Adelaide, when she got home to Stratty, her house had been wrecked. It's the challenge, it's the people being challenged by what's in that. So that's um, most of my writing friends in general who, have, who come from a range of cultural backgrounds, a range of uh, genres, wish that they could have the power of the work that Ujiru did. She's from North Stradbroke Island, is a very important figure in Queensland, where I live now, but she was a leading voice for all black fellas, like uh, Hillis Maris, um, as a respected poet, writer, political activist, artist, and educator. She had a lifelong commitment to advancing civil rights and improving the lives of our people. 
She was a leading voice in the fight towards the 1967 referendum, but her gift for storytelling of writing is what shines most for me. She released a series of books for young readers, uh, recreating the stories she learned as a young girl, starting with Stradbroke Dreamtime in 1972. Her contribution to education was acknowledged by a number of institutions. She was awarded honorary doctorates from Macquarie Uni in 1988, Griffith Uni 1989, Monash 1991, and Queensland University of Technology in 1992. In 1990, after the formation of ATSIC, she was elected a member of the South East Queensland Regional Council and she continued to advocate for her mob until she passed away in September 1993. During my PhD, I spent quite a bit of time with Aunty Ruby langford Guinnaby. Don't Take Your Love to Town. Who in the room's read Don't Take Your Love to Town? It is one of the most widely read uh, autobiographies of her time when it came out. It came out 1987, uh, 88, around the same time as Sally Morgan's My Place, but didn't have the same um, commercial impact, but very different stories. But her voice, Aunty Ruby Langford Guinnaby's voice, is what was needed in the classroom. It was set on the New South Wales HSC for many, many years. She, she said she decided to pick up the pen in 1984 to write her autobiography because she realised there was nothing taught in the school curriculum about Koori's. She said, and I quote, I thought if I wrote about my experiences as an Aboriginal person, it might give the other side, the white side, some idea of how hard it is to survive between black and white culture of Australia, and they might become less racist and paternalistic towards our people. She also said that she wrote much of her work to redress the negative portrayal of Aboriginal people in print, saying, for many years we've been misrepresented by misinformed people and have never had a voice, end quote. The way in which Aboriginal people have been categorised by race in terms of where we fit in society, into literature, is no, way, no different, sorry, is no different to the way in which we've been defined in sports, history, the arts and politics, and even academia. Although many would like to be regarded in a critique for our writing rather than our race, Aboriginal author as a title is also a cementing of identity for us and a categorisation that doesn't offend most. Most writers are proud of their identity as well as their ability to write in a profoundly white world. Because in the words of Ruby Langford Guinnaby, we are reclaiming our history, our heritage and our identity and that's very important to our cause. I'm pleased to note that in 1995, Ruby Langford Guinnaby was awarded an honorary doctorate of letters from La Trobe University. Now, although the Davian Iron Upon Award was created by UQP to honour the, the amazing work of Naranjeri Man, um, inventor, writer, and pastor Davian Iron I just wanted to flag tonight, and I'm, there's no disrespect at all, but it's interesting that most of the winners of this annual award for unpublished writers have been women. I think these are the books that need to be on curriculum. I can say here at Amongst Friends, you may or may not want to tweet this, tweet this, but I've read Shakespeare. I studied Hamlet. I also read the crib notes. I saw various productions and I enjoyed them. But I'm not a fan of making it compulsory for Australian students to study the literature of dead white male writers from England. I'll say it again. I'm not a fan of making it compulsory for Australian students to study the literature of dead white male writers from England. Our students, especially Indigenous students, need to see the relevance of the work they study to their lives today. When talking about education and our future, the reality is that English literacy is vital to Aboriginal people's self-determination. Self-determination requires each of us to have the literacy, to gain the knowledge, to have the power to make our own decisions and control our own futures, to be self-determined. Alarmingly, statistics around Indigenous literacy, particularly when measured against non -indigenous our non-Indigenous counterparts, are appalling. While education of all Australians should remain the role of government, the grassroots community work of the Australian book industry, facilitated by the Indigenous Literacy Foundation, has created a model for what is possible in terms of increasing Indigenous reading rates through strategic, culturally appropriate and interesting approaches. The 2006 National Assessment Program for Literacy and Numeracy, NAPLAN, uh, the report results show that only one quarter of Indigenous Year 5 students in remote areas were at, were at 
or above the national minimum standard for reading compared to 91% for non-Indigenous students. Although there has been a definite improvement amongst Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander students in Year 3 and Year 5 in reading across the board, there is still a long way to go for students in remote and very remote regions. Only one quarter of Indigenous Year 5 students in very remote areas were at or above the national minimum standard for reading. I've done that again, sorry, compared to 91%, sorry. Now, the National Chair of the Association of Heads of Independent Schools, Karen Spiller, says there is a long way to go. She welcomes gains in early learning, but emphasises that the transition from primary school to secondary school and building writing skills still needs more attention from policy makers. Many people ask why there is a literacy gap. There are many complex issues that impact on the results, and in most cases, a combination of factors. These include issues like historical, health, social and educational disadvantage. Even the simplest things, like quality reading materials and resources, items that most of us in this room probably take for granted, are not present in many remote and very remote communities across Australia. Most of the remote communities that the ILF work with report there are less than five, book, five books in family homes. The ILF's approach to raising literacy levels start at a community level. The focus is on early exposure to appropriate and quality books through book supply to homes and communities. We now supply books, uh, book packs into more than 230 remote communities and this number is increasing every year. The Book Buzz program is providing effective, uh, proving effective in, in a community in WA and shows how providing young children from zero to five years old with the right resources and in language, because we do bicultural, uh, bilingual, sorry, it works, is a great start in developing pre-reading skills. One of the reasons I became an ILF ambassador was um, it's not because I'm an author, although I do hope that kids in remote communities can one day, one day enjoy my, my kids' novels because I'm writing Aboriginal characters for them. I'm an ambassador because I know that in an Aboriginal context, I'm lucky to have had the education and the resources to be able to read. And I've raised literacy in the ILF tonight because universities, I'm sorry, there's probably the wrong place to say it, but universities aren't the be all and end all of education. It's true. Yes, we want to get more black fellows into tertiary institutions, but the buy-in for unis needs to come before year 11 and 12. The commitment to real change in education comes from whether or not our kids are getting the education they need from infancy. None of our youth should be leaving school at the age of 15 without adequate English literacy skills. So Mark Rose, where are you? Take that, can you take that issue please, to the next Universities Australia meeting? Thank you. Uh, these are two books I worked on. I went up to the Catherine to the Big River Hawks with the ILF and we did these fellas. One of the principals said to, that one of the principals said to me, well, you know, some of the boys in that class wrote more in a morning than they'd written all year. We got them to write about 40. Imagine walking out onto the MCG. You are playing for the Hawks in the grand final. And so we, we, we wrote a book called Shock'em, Stories of the Big River Hawks. And this book was done with the girls from Tiwi College. And, and so we do intensive workshops. They learn the process. They become authors. And then we sell the books and we, for profit and we use the profits to do more community projects. I'm a firm believer that only when we are self-determined as individuals, we will be self-determined as a nation. And education is the key to self-determination to having the power to make informed decisions about things that affect our lives. Education, therefore, is the key to nation building. We need to learn about economic sustainability, governance, legislation that protects our rights. We need to be part of the political system that we all live under, the Westminster system. I remember when I was writing this at university, it was called the Washminster system. Any level of growth, change, development and sustainability in our communities comes back to one thing education. Finally, as you leave here tonight and ponder this event, remind yourselves that many in this very space this evening are the strong, outspoken Aboriginal women that Hillis spoke about in the clip that we watched. They are the women who have followed in Hillis Maris's footsteps and they are leaving footprints that the Warroa students, the La Trobe students and the young Indigenous kids like this in Cowra will walk in into the future. Thank you very much.
you, Dr. Anita Heiss. Could I now please call on uh, Professor Richard Larkins to give a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lois. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting and pay my respects to their elders past and present. But what a wonderful lecture. Before thanking Anita, I'd just like to say a couple of words about Lois because it may not be apparent to you what a strong and wonderful uh, Indigenous and Aboriginal woman Lois is too and uh, what she's achieved in her career. Uh, Sapphire, yes, senior. <laughs> See, <laughs> Victorian Senior Australian of the Year, the Executive D Director and Principal of Warwick College, uh, a, and, and in her own right, a warrior of her indigenous rights throughout her career. It's a wonderful achievement. <laughs> and, of, and of course, a very distinguished sister of uh, Hillis Morris. Anita, that's a, a fabulous lecture. Uh, it had everything you'd want in a lecture celebrating Hillis Morris. But it is entertaining emphasised the things that she stood for, which was education, not just at university level, as you very correctly said, but as something that flows right through from early childhood development, right through primary school, secondary school, and through to the university level. Your own story and the story of the women in your family, I think, demonstrated beautifully the greater opportunities that have flowed in recent years, and also the ability of Indigenous women and men to make the most of those opportunities and to do the sorts of things that we've seen exemplified by the academic procession tonight. I think it's particularly appropriate that we have on International Women's Day and the 50th anniversary of La Trobe University such a demonstration of the role that Indigenous women have played and uh, continue to play and the transformation which is occurring. Too often we talk about um, in, uh, Indigenous people, Aboriginal people, in terms of gaps, disadvantage and so on. And much more we should be talking about achievement given opportunity and what uh, wonderful things they can contribute uh, to, to, the, um, to us all. I'm particular thr particularly thrilled about becoming Chancellor of La Trobe University for two reasons relating to um, Indigenous education. The first is what we've heard about from the Vice-Chancellor and reiterated uh, by, by Anita, uh, the opportunity that La Trobe is providing at the tertiary education level for Indigenous students and how it's reaching down into schools to enable more Indigenous students to come here. But the second reason is the celebration we have and recognition of the contribution of Aboriginal culture. It's something we all should be so proud of instead of talking about disadvantage. And I think we've just seen it demonstrated so wonderfully tonight. So Anita, thank you very much. Uh, it, is a, it is a great lecture, inspirational, and I'm sure Hillis Morris, uh, if she was able to, to be here, would be very proud of uh, what you've said in her memory. Thank you. If you wouldn't mind coming back to the stage for a moment. We just have a, a small thank you from La Trobe University for your lecture. Thank you, Professor Larkins. Tonight is certainly um, a night of celebration. Um, and I'd like to invite to the stage now two of our younger music artists, Nathaniel Andrew, who is also Hillis's nephew, <laughs> and we're really very excited that we have with us tonight um, Isaiah Firebrace, also Yorta Yorta. <laughs> and yeah. 
there's some really good, great news. Before we just go into that, can we just say that uh, Isaiah is going to represent Australia in the Eurovision? Is that right? <laughs> Now, you know that um, from uh, uh, Dr. Julie Andrews uh, telling us Hillis's journey, Hillis was born on Kamraganja, which is on the banks of the Murray River. And I think we're going to just have a little reflection on that tonight. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. <laughs> uh, so, first of all, I just want to say Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight to sing for you guys. Um, I feel really honoured to be a part of this and I want to introduce the first song I'm singing tonight. It's called A Change Is Gonna Come by Sam Cooke. And to me this song represents um, always wanting a change to come in your life and always wanting your dream to come true. So here it is. I don't know what's up there beyond the sky. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change is gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. I go to the movie. And I go downtown Everybody keep telling me Don't you hang around It's been a long A long time coming But I know A change is gonna come Oh yes it will Ooh. Then I go oh, 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 to my brother And I say, brother, help me please But he just winds up knocking me yeah, Back down on my knees Oh, there were times that I thought I thought I wouldn't last for long But now I think I am able to carry on It's been a long, a long time coming But I know a change is gonna come It's been a long A long, long time coming But I know My change is gonna come Thank you. Thank you. 
So this next song is a kind of pretty old song. Um, it was first sung in the Wizard of Oz, the original Wizard of Oz. And it's called Somewhere Over the Rainbow. And also I love this song because it's got a good message in it. And to me it, al it means always thinking to yourself, why can't it be me to achieve my dreams? And once, once you get that over the rainbow, and you do achieve your dreams, you just got to take it with pride and just stay true to yourself and go onwards and upwards from there. So here it is. I hope you guys like it. So That you dare, you dare to dream, they really do come true. Someday I wish upon the star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Oh, yes, I will. Where troubles, they melt like lemon drops. Oh, way above the chimney tops, that's where you find me. Ooh, that's where you'll find me. Oh, 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 oh. Ooh, oh, oh. yeah, 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 yeah. Someday I wish upon the star and wake up where the clouds are far behind me. Where troubles they melt like lemon drops, oh, where above. The chimney tops, that's where you find me. Oh, 
the dreams that you dare to dream really do really do come true if happy little bluebirds fly above the rainbow I why oh I can't I oh why tell privilege to have those young musicians with us tonight. It's just, I feel we need to give them another clap. <laughs> Friends, um, there have been many wonderful words spoken and uh, astute observations made tonight. If my sister Hillis were here, she would be amazed. She'd be very pleased. And she'd be pleased to see the education and the hard-won success of the speakers, our academics, and our guests. But she'd always also tell us that it hasn't gone far enough yet. <clears throat> and, um, you know, the challenges so often espoused in mainstream, and we are endeavouring to close the gap. But I want to say that the gap has not always been on our side. There's the gap in terms of culture. We have a culture that still lives, complete with its own knowledge base, its own philosophy and beliefs. And in the words of Hillis Morris, she said, Aboriginality comes out of the culture. It comes out of being the people who belong here. It comes out of pride of an ancient history and values that sustained a people for countless thousands of years and that are still relevant today that produced a balanced people. We who have survived and still survive amongst the apathy all around us today have the courage and the will and the pride to be Aboriginal in this situation. Pride in ourselves gives us a belief in ourselves. Our ancestors have known themselves so completely as human beings for so long this is one of the reasons we reach out to grasp hold of this Aboriginality in this different individualistic society. Those were the words of Hillis Maris. And I'd just, I just like to add to that. As Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, culture is central to our being. It is our strength in who we are. Honouring all that came before and respecting the beauty of the past and the struggle of our elders is the unmovable platform on which we stand. From that place, we can annex all we need to, do, to be able to connect with and succeed in the dominant cultures of which we have become a part. It is only when we stand in that strong place 
where we know absolutely who we are, that we are not able to be cut adrift. We are Indigenous people on firm ground, able to choose how we operate in this world. We are not playing catch up. We are not bridging a gap. We are standing strong with our past, looking out and able to make decisions about how we wish to proceed. This was the core of Hillis's dream. Education was the key but it had to be an education that did more than the academic learning. It had to embrace our culture. It had to look at our well-being. It had to be an education that was seen through an Aboriginal lens. So what a privilege it has been tonight to hear from Hillis's niece, Dr Julie Andrews, who shared the journey of Hillis Morris an Indigenous author, Dr Anita Heiss, who shared her personal journey and the influence of other Indigenous women. Um, Anita, I just have to say I loved your, um, your books and uh, the titles. I particularly like Am I Black Enough for You? <laughs> That's got to be my personal favourite. To the La Trobe, Leadership, Professor Richard Larkins uh, and Vice-Chancellor John Dewar. Your understanding and estimation of education and of what Hillis Morris brought to the educational community is heartening. While we do have a long way to go, we are walking with steady steps towards a future where our children can freely express their own understandings while taking their place as leaders of the future. My hope is that we will continue to hear of the journeys, perhaps from those amongst us tonight who will share their story and continue to inspire us all. So tonight, as we again remember and celebrate an Aboriginal woman who was a poet, writer, playwright and educator, I can't go past the impetus for all of Hillis's work. She wanted our children to be able to learn and know for sure that they were a part of a valuable and unique people. She wanted them to be able to have choices while understanding they brought with them knowledge and understandings they could share with the world. That education is the key. She left us a powerful poem as a reminder a poem that we say every day at Warrawa Aboriginal College. And it starts, I am a child of the Dreamtime people. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Could I ask you to please stand for the um, exit of the um, academic group? Thank you.